On today's show, big weekend for the Cavs. They capped off five games in seven days with a fifth win in seven days. We'll talk about all of that with Danny Cunningham and the post-trade deadline situation on this new one. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Cavs Pelicans was perhaps the best win of the Cavs season in some ways, at least the maybe one of their best three to five halves played in terms of how dominant they were in the first half. Joining me to break this game down is the man you just heard. Help me break out the trade deadline. It's Danny Cunningham. Danny, what stands out to you from Cavs Pelicans? A 118 to 107 Cavs win that I think felt like a much bigger win than an 11 point win. It definitely felt like a much bigger win than an 11 point win. So there were two things that stood out to me that are both really great signs. And I guess the best way to say it is that they add up to one big thing that stood out to me. Um, The first thing that I noticed right away is that, and Donovan Mitchell didn't play Wednesday night. I think it was more of a rest night for him because of that sore groin than it was actually the groin bothering him that caused him to sit out. But Mitchell looked more explosive than he has in the past three weeks. I, he really looked like the guy that was around for the first two and a half, three months of the season that hasn't been the same since that groin injury. That is a great sign for the Cavs. The other thing, Chris, is that Evan Mo, despite that, and Mitchell was awesome tonight. He had 30 points on 21 shots. He was fantastic. Despite that, Evan Mobley was the best player on the floor. And there have not been nights. There have been moments where Evan's been the best player on the floor when Donovan's got it going on. But there haven't really been nights as a whole when Evan Mobley has been the best player on the floor when Donovan Mitchell's having a good night. Tonight that happened, and I think that is an incredibly great sign for the Cavs moving forward because if they're going to get that type of effort from Donovan Mitchell, that type of output from him, and he's going to be the second best player on the team, there's not very many teams that are capable of beating the Cavs on those nights. Let's hit on Mitchell first, because I think in, in some ways this is is maybe the most important headline to kind of look at here. Mitchell looked like the all-NBA Mitchell that was the guy earlier season. This was his first 30-point game in over a month. The last time he scored over 30 points when the Cavs lost to the Jazz uh, on January 10th. He has had a rough month. That groin has clearly been bothering him. And this was a Mitchell that was getting a lift on his jump shots that had drives and explosive moments in the half court that he hasn't had of late. You know, I think of the drive in the end when he had on CG McCollum, this, that was not like the most explosive play he had all night, but he gets the switch, he probes and he waits until the right moment and then explodes to get to the foul, gets the end one. He's not making that play if his groin's not right. And he can't kind of push off the one leg and get, and get past McCollum in that way. And then you, and then you saw the, you know, like the defensive possession he had on Brandon Ingram, was just like pure effort and pure just motor. Yeah. This is this is the best Mitchell has looked in a while, and it comes at a good time. This is right around the All-Star break. You want the best Mitchell you possibly can have for the Philly game next week if you're the Cavs, and it's just you need him healthy. The best version of this team, the team that has a chance to make some noise in the playoffs, has to have this Mitchell, and he looks right, and that's big, big, big for the stretch run going into the All-Star break. It's huge for them, Chris. Um, you know, you you hit on everything. The defense, and I think that as a team, the Cavs really looked connected defensively. And New Orleans made some tough shots at times. I actually think that the Cavs probably played a little bit better defense than the number of points that they gave up tonight. Mm-hmm. Mitchell was really good on both ends of the floor. Like that is, and this dates back even further than when he hurt his groin the last time they played the Pelicans when New Orleans was in town on Martin Luther King Day. I think there was, I think it was the Suns game. The first Suns game, it was the game after his 71 point game where he slipped on the floor. And I think it was then that he tweaked his groin and then he injured it worse on MLK Day. If you think back to since that 71 point game, he's really not been very good, or I shouldn't say not been very good. He's still been good, but he hasn't been nearly as explosive. And I think tonight we really saw that. And what I'm now most curious. Because as we record this, it's almost 1 o'clock in the morning, Saturday, February 11th. The Cavs play another game 
in less than 20 hours, what's Donovan Mitchell going to look like then? If he looks like, if he plays tomorrow, which I, we don't know if he's going to at this point, if he plays in that game and he looks the way that he did tonight, I really, really feel good about the Cavs. Yeah, and you feel good about where Mitchell's at. To turn to Mobley, my goodness, Danny. My goodness. It's I, incredible. He, he was the best player on the floor, and I don't think it was close. <laughs> which, Mitchell, which is saying a lot because Donovan was really good tonight. Like, yeah, Donovan and like, played at an all-NBA level tonight. And look, and even with the foul trouble, Darius Garland did some stuff in this game. You're just like, oh my goodness. Some of the passes Garland pulled off in this game were just like magician, magician stuff. I, te- I was, we, they were talking about this on the broadcast. And I, I texted you my answer, but I'd love to like know what, what the kind of the consensus is on who he's a hybrid of. I think it's like a CP3 Dame hybrid. And that is like the ultimate compliment I think you can give Darius Garland because yeah. he's just <sighs> insane. But I think he's sort of. Today. He's sort of Dame with CP3's athleticism because Dame, he's not the athlete that Dame is. Like, Dame can jump in a way that I don't think Darius is necessarily but he's got capable the, of. Yeah, but, he, but he's got the pull-up jumper that Dame has. Like, he has take that, he's had that kind of pulled right from the Dame playbook as far as the pull-up yeah. threes go. I, I think that he's got a similar athleticism or similar, I guess, a similar tempo style to Chris Paul, but a skill set that mirrors Damian Lillard in that sense. Okay, so Evan Mobley, stat line here, 28 points, 13 (laughs) boards, three steals, two blocks, two or three from the line. Uh, It was 13 of 18 from the field and did everything you could want on defense. There's a block on Najee Marshall where he just kind of like lets him get into the lane and he erases (laughs) it. This kick starts uh, Darius Garland fast break. He had a, a, a deflection that was just like his arm is just in the right place and it deflects a Karis LeVert gets out on the break. He has these possessions over and over and over again, Danny, where he is defending inside and he does the correct rotation, but he's so long and so aware that he's able to rotate back to Eunice Valanciunas and alter shots. He is everywhere in defense. And then that doesn't even get to, he had Brandon Ingram. He defended Brandon Ingram in this game. Mm -hmm. His assignment was, you go defend Brandon Ingram, who's the lead predator of New Orleans offense without Zion and, and with CJ McCollum, I think a little bit banged up. Yeah. You know, Ingram has 25 points. He has eight assists. He has like a good game, but go back and watch the film. Go back and rewatch clips of this game. The only moments Ingram felt like a part of this game were when Dean Wade is guarding him or he gets the switch on a Jared Allen and he's able to go to work there or the couple of times a Coro defended up on him. When it's Mobley, Mobley's eating his space. He's denying him clean looks. He's denying him driving lanes. Ingram, not once did I feel he looked comfortable with Evan Mobley on him. And this is like the successor to the Jimmy Butler defensive game that Mobley had a couple weeks ago. This guy is leveling up and he's he's an all defensive level guy because he's doing this kind of stuff. I he's he's just sensational. He's the best player on the floor in this game and it's not close. So I want to speak to what you said um about like always kind of having his hand or his arm in the right place and the rotations that he makes because I've noticed that a lot throughout really the last four or five weeks. Like there will be times when guys will do that that Nash dribble sort of where they mm-hmm. they don't necessarily get all the way through the paint, but they they dribble around, they don't attempt a shot, and they want to turn back to attempt to pass. It's not that Evan knows where to be. It's that his timing is impeccable every single time. He knows where to be, and he knows exactly when he needs to be there. And for someone his age, that is uncanny. Of all the things defensively that he does, and he's an athletic freak, he's super long, like can block shots. But the timing aspect of things, I think, is what I'm most impressed by with him, Chris. He's having a leap, I think. This is yeah. worth like a, a bigger discussion, I think, like in writing, I think in in discussing it with the team. I think it is worth talking about it more at length, you know, on, on in your airways, he's been 50 here on Lockdown Cavs. But I think he's having the leap. And if there were any, I think there were like some pretty loud wonderings of like okay is he progressing earlier this year and that that was like a thing those are no longer i think a thing at all i think there was some validity in kind of like saying he had he had not maybe progressed in a meaningful way i think there were logical reasons for that when you just look at the context he is now blowing all of these out of the water (laughs) he is now just absolutely crushing things out of the water he's doing everything you want i thought one of the best observations on the broadcast that sometimes I think can get overlooked because he's a big is that he is not just getting spoon fed lobs and spoon fed little handoffs and getting to them. He's creating for himself in small ways. It is not like loading up on the perimeter and going ISO and hitting pull-ups, but he's got that little fadeaway jumper in the post. He's got that little, the, the jump step. 
into into a dunk or into a layup. He's got like a li- moves in the in the inside now. Like he's leveled well, up in this way. I mean, Chris, think about that hook shot that he's got. That he can get to that almost any time, mm-hmm. and it's it's something that's really not stoppable. So since Martin Luther King Day, he and I don't know if this has tonight's stats in it or not. I'm not sure of that. Averaging 19 and a half points on 57% shooting. Yeah, he's not making threes, but he's doing that while averaging nine and a half rebounds a game, while blocking almost two shots a game, while averaging a steal a game. Like he has been an absolute monster. And the Cavs are just blowing the doors off teams when he's on the floor. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely annihilating teams when he's playing. Like he, and like plus minus is a stat that doesn't always tell the whole story, right? That is something you hear a lot, especially when you like, I think JB was asked about it earlier this year and he said, plus minus is used in contract negotiations and that's it. Don't (laughs) worry about it. Well, Evan Mobley was a plus 18 tonight and it felt every bit of that, like his impact mirrored that stat. And it's not always like that, but it just felt like when, when he was on the floor and when the Pelicans had Jonas Valanciunas on the floor, Jonas Valanciunas had absolutely no prayer on either end of the floor. No, not at all. A couple other small things I'll hit and we'll, we'll get out of here. Number one, Jared Allen, I thought had a very good game against Jonas Valanciunas, had a really nice drive and dunk on, on JV. That is a key development for him. If he's going to pass and do that stuff when, when that jumper from the free throw line isn't falling, that's a big deal. I thought Okoro, even though it's not the biggest Okoro game, just seven points but had a great cut, made a three. He had, did kind of exactly what you'd want him to do. Really good defense on McCollum. And look, he's here after the deadline. I thought Karis LeVert, with no Ricky Rubio, played as well as you could want Karis LeVert to play. Five of 10, 13 points, nine dimes. I thought like a pretty good Karis LeVert game in the context. You know, any small things for you, Danny, stand out? Chris, if, if Karis LeVert gives the Cavs 13 and nine, they're going to be re- on efficient shooting while shooting 50%. They're not going to lose many games. No. Like the Cavs can get into trouble when Karis LeVert's the third ball handler the way he was tonight. And he goes four of 13 and finishes with nine points and five assists and four turnovers. When Karis LeVert gives you almost a double double, the Cavs are not going to lose. Like that's just, he is an X factor in, in that sense. And I think Isaac Okoro is in a similar light. It's certainly different skill sets, but like, Games when Isaac Okoro scores 15 points, the Cavs just are not going to lose very many of them. That's how I feel about Karis LeVert. Hello to Danny's wonderful cat. That's, a, that's an yeah. Evan move. That's an Evan move from you right there. <laughs> but that's going to be it. Yeah, it's okay. It's wonderful. I, this, is a, this is a pro pet podcast. I'm a dog person, but you know, cat, cats are welcome. This is a pro cat podcast. Well, if they make you happy, they make you happy. Cavs beat the Pelicans 118 to to 107. Eh, look, animals are good. 118 to 107. Like to basically kind of cruise through the fourth quarter. It didn't matter. Dominant first half. Mitchell looked great. Mobley was the best player in the floor. Fun stuff. Bulls up next. We'll cover that next segment. Or if you're listening to that on Sunday morning, you can listen to that on Sunday morning. Thanks again to Danny for coming through. And sorry, Evan ducked you again, Danny. He he wants no parts of this man. He does not want any of that smoke. No smoke. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly track qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post, company, and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates, identify the qualified candidates on LinkedIn Jobs, and connect with them fast and for free. LinkedIn Jobs helps you makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all on one platform. It's why LinkedIn, it's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked in MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked in MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, Danny Cunningham's back. Hi. Danny, we have another game to talk about. It's Cavs Bulls. Another night, another game. 
five games in seven nights for the Cavs, six straight wins in overall for them. Danny, I, I want to start with that. This game was a little weird. We'll get into some of the things that were weird and, and ultimately what was impressive in, in the Cavs pulling off a win. I, I, I do think, though, that it is worth really shouting out that they have traveled a bunch. They have now won five games in seven days. They're undefeated since Dylan Brooks hit Donovan Mitchell below the belt last week when the Cavs beat the Grizzlies. And here we are. They look a little tired. I think you could feel that in this Bulls game, particularly coming off of their travel schedule and everything that went into the win against the Pelicans. But look, five wins in seven days, six straight overall, is a really, really impressive stretch. And when I think when you look back at this season and we when we do any retrospectives, this to me, Danny, will be one of the highlight stretches of this year. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it is so difficult, Chris. And I kind of think by the end of a stretch like this, it almost doesn't matter who a team is playing because I think a team starts essentially playing against themselves, both physically and mentally. Like tonight, the Cavs won that game against the Bulls in part because the Bulls stink. Like that is, I think, a fair way to to say it. Like that's just not a very good team in Chicago right now. I think that's part of it. But I think that the Cavs, because... You know, they didn't get back from New Orleans until four o'clock in the morning. I'm sure guys didn't get into bed till five o'clock in the morning after they got home from the airport. The Cavs are and that alone, like if this just would have been a standalone back to back, it would have been a difficult game. But the fact that it is the fifth game in a week for them makes it all the more difficult. So they start essentially battling with themselves mentally because that tiredness seeps in the legs are heavy they're physically and just mentally drained so to overcome that and really just absolutely destroy the will of the bulls in the fourth quarter i thought despite the fact that it was not a it was not a great game like this is not a game that's going to end up on the end of the season highlight package the Cavs didn't play all that well because of a lot of the things i've already mentioned but what they were able to do tonight and able to crack, scratch and claw their way to a win, I thought was really impressive. Here's what I think stands out from, from the win at the end of this, this long stretch. Number one, I thought the second half, particularly I thought the fourth quarter, they, they really turned it on. The Bulls only had 15 points in the fourth quarter. It, it felt, Danny, like the entire game had shifted. The Cavs are a team that I think were a little bit on their heels in the first half, a little bit out of their just rhythm. I thought that was maybe best illustrated by what whatever Darius Garland did in the first half of this game when he had three points, and I thought just played very un-Darius Garland-like and how he was picking his spots and how he just was kind of not really integrated into the flow of the game. And then they just kind of put the bulls in their heels. It's kind of, I thought kind of fin- finished off when Billy Donovan gets a technical. You felt the frustration from Chicago just kind of seep in everything and it got a little dicey late the Cavs had to make some free throws and have a call go their way and and things kind of work out but they they were on their heels and they just kind of gritted their teeth they pushed back and they won gritty as a cliche but I feel like it applies here that this was a, a really gritty win and there's some tactical things we talk about too but it starts there for me yeah and I I'm with you like I don't love using the word gritty to describe things but I also don't know of a better a more fitting word for this game on Saturday night. Like it it was, they gritted it out. Like that's exactly what they did. It was a game that they didn't, they did not play well in the first half. Like they missed so many open threes. I think that if they would have played the bulls tomorrow or Monday and had a little bit of rest and put forth like the same effort in terms of what shots they're able to create, This is a game I think they win by 25 points. Like the Cavs were getting great looks. They couldn't make any of them. Cleveland was one of 17 on corner threes, Chris. So bad. You are not going to win games doing that very often. The fact that they were able to find a way despite that. And I do think it's worth noting, like they played really well defensively. They And even though they had heavy legs, they couldn't get shots to fall. They can rely upon their defense, and I think that's exactly what we saw, certainly at times on Saturday night. Fourth quarter, let's just to run through this, not just on the defensive side. Excuse me, just not just on the defense side. Look at the offense as well. You had 12 points in the fourth from Donovan Mitchell, who 
looks awesome. He he looks falling off the Pelicans game. He looks just as explosive as he as he has. Garland has seven in the fourth. He looked as good as he did all night in that quarter. You got four from Mobley, four from Allen. And I think tactically, it was interesting to see them go to this one big and four guards or two wing, two guards and two wings, however you want to kind of phrase it. You know, in the second half, here's who played minutes in in the second half in in a very pared down rotation from JB Bickerstaff. Mitchell plays 22. Garland plays 21. Mobley plays 18. Allen plays 16. Okoro plays 12. Levert plays 15. Ricky Rubio plays nine in, in about 40 seconds. Jetty Osmond plays four minutes and 18 seconds. No Lamar Stevens, who didn't play at all in this game. No Dean Wade, who played a bunch in the first half. Obviously, no Kevin Love with where that's at right now. They really paired this back. He buckled down on what he thought would work, and it was a swerve. It was a, a very tactical swerve to go, we're going to space. We're going to put ball handlers on the floor. We're going to play a little smaller away from some of this stuff, and, and it really, really worked. And it threw the, the I thought the Bulls a different look. It The bigs kind of roamed free and did whatever they want in a lot of ways, and the guards just kind of have really good chemistry. And I think Ricky Rubio in particular, you feel him as this real big connector piece. He doesn't make a shot you know, in the second half. He's 0-5. And yet he has four assists, just the one turnover. And you feel like coming away being like, oh, yeah, Ricky Rubio was like a real contributor, even though he doesn't score a single point in in almost 10 minutes of play in the second half. Well, Chris, it's really funny just even looking at the whole game or I I suppose even the second half. But Karis LeVert and Ricky Rubio, neither one of them made a field goal. Karis played 15 minutes, 0 of 2, had one point. You know, he made a free throw. Ricky didn't score. He was 0-5-0 of 6 for the night. Cavs outscored the Bulls in the second half by 15 points with Karis LeVert on the floor, by 14 points with Ricky Ruby on the floor. And I realized that, and we talked about this when we chatted after the Pelicans game, that plus minus is not always a, you know, a true indicator of what a performance was. Just like, I don't think Karis LeVert was that good or Ricky was necessarily that good. But I do think that it speaks to the fact that the Cavs were legitimately... They just gave Chicago a different look that the Bulls could not handle defensively. And on a night when the Cavs couldn't get the open shots they were generating to fall, I thought that this was a really smart move by by J.B. Bickerstaff and his coaching staff to figure this out. Last thing on this game that I that I think does just kind of stand out, Danny, that I, I don't know what to make of it because this game was a little bit messy. I thought Evan Mobley did a really good job defending DeMar DeRozan. I felt it didn't quite kind of isolate things in the same way. Maybe that's just a fatigue thing, but how, how do you, this is now maybe the third time this year, fourth time this year, depending, I, you have to go back and look, but the three big ones would be the Butler against Miami, Brandon Ingram on fr- on Friday night. And then this night, Evan Mobley defends DeMar DeRozan for a big chunk of this game. Where are you at on, on using Mobley kind of in this way, a little more on ball, a little more aggressively on some of these bigger perimeter scores that, that they may come up against. So I think that it's a smart thing that they're doing. I think we're probably at a certain point, Chris, going to see this go away. Maybe when we get into March um, and certainly the last few games of the season in April, I wouldn't expect Devin Mobley to be doing this because I think that this is what the Cavs want to do in the playoffs. I think that this is the defensive strategy they want to employ. They recognize Evan Mobley is their best defender. Um, I like Jarrett Allen's awesome. Donovan Mitchell has been surprisingly good defensively. Isaac Okoro is fantastic on that end of the floor, but Evan Mobley is head and shoulders above all of them. So I do think that when the Cavaliers make it to the playoffs this year, and if they're in a seven game series, say they're in the four five matchup with Miami, I firmly expect Evan Mobley to be defending Jimmy Butler. If they make it to the second round against Boston, where we've seen them take on the Celtics twice this year, Evan Mobley really didn't spend a ton of time defending Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown. I would expect that to be his assignment. I think that what the Cavs have been doing with Mobley on defense over the last couple of weeks is getting him ready for what his assignments are going to look like during the playoffs. I think it's terrific practice for him. Last night with Brandon Ingram was another example. Jimmy Butler was another example. I don't know that we necessarily talked about, and I'm not speaking you and I, Yeah, but I don't know that it was made a big enough deal for what he did against Brandon Ingram and just nope. this shift in defensive philosophy um, just because it's, I think it's going to be something that's really important down the sh- when the playoffs arrive. 
The one I really want to see uh, when they play Toronto in, in a little bit here is the Siakam one. I don't know if that they'll necessarily do that, but that's the one I really want to see. The way Mobley's playing on defense right now, Siakam will present this different sort of linear physical driver that maybe Ingram doesn't, that you know Butler does, but he's a little bit smaller. It's like a very unique challenge. That That is that is the one I want to see before we kind of get into the playoff stuff. All right, we're going to go to break, come back, and we're going we're gonna to finish up talking about the week ahead for the Cavs, but first... Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Look, the midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000, that's a great deal. And that's bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. This week, there's a lot to like in the NBA world. I mean, you, I can't wait to see what the line is for Cavs 76ers on Wednesday. That's going to be a massive game. We'll be talking about that coming up next. Maybe there's some kind of Donovan Mitchell, Joel Embiid centered same, same game parlay with for point totals for both. Garland assist is another one I'd look at in that matchup if, if he's going to be on it and having things popping. Look, there's so many more exclusive bets like they're 2x2 two times 3, two three-pointers scored in the first three minutes. And FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So don't miss a chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 excuse me, in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com backslash locked on. That is FanDuel.com backslash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, last segment, locked on Cavs. Danny Cunningham's here. Evan will be back tomorrow, but no, no Danny, t- no, uh, no Evan today. Danny, I want to just start with one bit of news. Terrence Ross is off the buyout market. He is going to be a Phoenix Sun. It looked like he might be going to Dallas, but he is going to be headed to Phoenix. This would have been, I think, the number one target if I'm Cleveland on the market. But he's off. I don't, and I, I don't think they were, they necessarily were going to be in the running anyway. But I do look at him, and I think that would have been a nice, nice fit to maybe upgrade that Carousel Vert spot. But the Cavs roster is what it is. I don't think they're going to get a Dana Green. I don't think there's anyone else that really moves the needle for me. Terrence Ross would have been the guy. I also think it's okay that they don't they don't get him. Just like I think it's probably ultimately all right if that they did not make a move. Yeah, I I am with you completely there. Um, and I truthfully like. I understand that Phoenix can offer a lot of things that Cleveland can't just like as a city and, you know, Hey, it's getting to go play with Kevin Durant. That's gotta be a pretty cool thing. He, he but that roster now, win a title. He could yes, win a title. he could, but also that roster now in Phoenix is pretty thin because they don't have some of the pieces that they had to give away for Kevin Durant, um, especially out on the wing. So I think that even for Terrence Ross, it's as much about an opportunity there as it is ring chasing. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, but it's curious. Like to see he's gonna. What, I would guess yeah. he starts. I don't think he starts. I would suspect that starting five is gonna be Paul Booker, Durant, Tory Craig, and yeah, then, I would and think Aiden. that Terrence Ross starts instead of Tory Craig. Defensively, I wonder if you go Craig. Maybe. This, I mean, I I could listen to it, but I think that there's a chance he starts when he's in Phoenix, and that would yeah. not happen in Cleveland. Uh, check out Locked On Sun. Shout out Brendan Clean, my co-host on the Just Basketball Show. If you want some Terrence Ross content, maybe I'll be able to break the news to him like I did on the Durant thing. I didn't, he didn't know until I texted him because I somehow was I heard I him. heard that on on the Just Basketball podcast. I did hear that. That's right, real listener. Go listen, go listen to Danny and, and go listen. He, he talks to me enough. We text all the time, and yet he still you know goes out of his way to listen to an absurdly long uh, podcast that I that I'm hosting over there. But Danny, big week for the Cavs. Yes. Get the Spurs on Monday, get a day off, get the Super Bowl Sunday off, get a bad Spurs team who they did lose to in San Antonio earlier this year and, and probably the most frustrating loss of the entire calf season. At least one of them, I think that and the Warriors one would stand out if you ask them kind of what are the ones that maybe drive them the most nuts. You gotta Monday is not a ton to say. We'll see kind of what happens there. We'll see what that looks like. I I think the Philly game is going to be my most if I had to kind of think about stakes, I had to think about all of that. I think the Philly game is the most anticipated game of the year for me at this point, considering it's now on ESPN. 
considering it's it's the battle of you know potential really top seeds in the East. There's n- very very little not to like about that game. Yeah, I mean it. The Cavs, as we record this, are one game behind the Sixers. Um, and this is Chris. I I really really do think that the Cavs have a huge opportunity not only Wednesday but the rest of the season to overtake Philadelphia. I I think that. If I had to bet today where the Cavs are going to end up in the standings, I would say they're going to finish third in the East. Um, and beating Philadelphia, if they do on Wednesday, before the All-Star break, would go a long way. And I presume for the sake of this discussion, we are giving them a win on Monday against San Antonio because that's a game they should win. It's With where this team is at, having won six straight right now, I would be fairly stunned if they don't beat San Antonio. So if they beat San Antonio, they not only have a chance to take over third in the East, win the tiebreaker over the Sixers, but they'll also go into the All-Star break having matching their season high of an eight-game win streak that they had back in October, November. All of those things are a really big deal, I think, for this team, Chris. East standings right now, as we're recording this early Sunday, February 12th. Boston, first, they're a game up on the Bucks. 76ers are our third, three and a half back. Cavs are four and a half back. Big win, honestly, in in for for the sake of Wednesday to some degree that the Cavs did come back and beat the Bulls because Philly had a very close win in Brooklyn on Sunday, that uh, second night of a back-to-back for them, that if the Cavs had lost, they fall two games back and it, you're a little tighter going into Wednesday. They are in the we you and I talked about this post deadline. The cat it's a really really big deal if you can get up to three and it's it's kind of I think there should be the bare minimum expectation that you finish top four, based on the Nets kind of taking a step back. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. Go on, sorry. Well, no, it's okay. And then I, I do I think now that maybe like getting out of four or five is as big of a concern as it would have been if you're going to be the one of these good teams in the East that has to play like Brooklyn or Philly or the Cavs in round one. Like no, I. I don't necessarily believe that that is as much of a concern in terms of seeding. Like you might end up with Miami. You might end up with the Knicks. Three just gives you maybe the slightly lesser team of the the Celtics and the Bucks. That seems like that's where that's headed. I mean, pick your poison there. Those teams are both awesome. Those are probably the two favorites. And those are the two favorites in my mind in the East. But you, you might get a slightly worse team in round one. And you you just get that little bit of a higher seed. You get a little bit of accomplishment. You get a little bit of rub from that. And, you know, look, if Miami ends up being like the five seed, you could get the Nets, you could get the Knicks, you could get Atlanta, who's making a little bit of a run right now. Like, you get up to three, you're going to be in the positioning to maybe get a little bit a, a little bit of more manageable first-round thing. And I think if you're the Cavs, getting to the second round and maximizing your chances to get at least to the second round – is is all this is about right now. That is what this this end of the season run, that is what the playoffs will be about. It is about maximizing your playoff potential, your playoff experience this year right now. Yeah, and they are really in a great spot to do it. They've got one of the easiest schedules in basketball left. If you look at, and I know I mentioned this earlier, if you look at their last five games, they've got the Knicks, which is not an easy game, not an overly challenging game. They've got the Pacers who have fallen really, I mean, they're not in the plan right now, and I don't expect them to really rise back up the standings. They've got two games with Orlando, and they've got Charlotte. Like, the Cavs really, really, post-All-Star break, their schedule is not super easy with Denver and Atlanta on a back-to-back. But the Sixers have one of the most difficult schedules in basketball. I really do think that the Cavs should. I would be very surprised if they're not at least one game better than the Sixers. And at that point, it's going to come down to a tiebreaker. The Cavs have to win one of the last two games they have against Philly in Philly on Wednesday. And then Philadelphia comes back to Cleveland on March 15th. That game, however, also the second night of a back to back which they're in Charlotte the night before. So really Wednesday is even bigger than it seems on the surface because of that. Yeah, I think you get that tiebreaker. It really gives you some optimism. And the Cavs have done well against teams at the top of the East this year. They are 2-0 against Boston. They've beaten Milwaukee. Could have the tiebreaker against Philly here. That's that's not nothing in the scheme of in the season that we are are looking at right now. But that's going to be it for this episode of Lockdown Cavs. Thanks again to Danny for filling in for Evan. We'll be back uh, before, after, excuse me, after Cavs Spurs. Until then, I'm Chris. That's Danny. Evan will be back. Thanks again to Jake Stevens for producing as always. Be well.